well uh this night uh, i want to welcome us to another presentation an exciting presentation just full of history and uh, how i pray that uh, the lord will bless us as we go through this material um uh, i want to talk about um, from uh, gethsemane to calvary the history in the background or the background history that uh, maybe we never read in uh, the synoptic gospels about uh, the trial and the crucif crucifixion of uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, this is just overwhelming uh, to look at this. And uh, some of these materials are from uh, the book, Behold the Man um, by uh, Taylor Bunge. And so I like to pray and then uh, we can be able to share uh, together. Let us uh, pray. Our dear Father in heaven, thank you for this uh, session and thank you for the grace that uh, you allow us to have and the power of thy presence to be able to even read this stuff and be able to comprehend them and present them. I do pray that uh, you may guide my thoughts and uh, you'll be with the audience and these feeble instruments that they may be benefited by this presentation. And Lord, as we see how Jesus Christ, who had everything but left it for the sake of the salvation of humanity, Lord, may we also uh, be able to surrender everything for the salvation of souls. Even when we are mistreated, Lord, help us to just um, in humility surrender unto thee in everything in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, as you can see, the background uh, image, uh, it is uh, the setup of the Sanhedrin in that night. It may not be a true de uh, uh, depiction of the event, but um, it uh, somewhat uh, brings to view what happened in that night in symbols and images. Now, the trial and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ has been something that uh, has been acted in various movies and it has been told and retold by many people. But uh, I found the book by Taylor Burns that is Behold the Man so fascinating. And uh, I'd just like us to look into it and uh, with uh, some information and see how our Lord Jesus Christ was able to give up all his rights for the sake uh, of uh, uh, of the salvation of man. In Gethsemane, uh, after the third season of prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus returned to the three disciples uh, who were sleeping and said to them, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is betrayed in the hands of sinners. Uh, that is in the book of Matthew chapter 26, verse 45 and 46. And he told them, Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that that, that doth betray me. And uh, uh, commenting on this statement, uh, I'd like us to see what Sister White um, talks about this before we even just go for what she had to speak about um, this uh, situation and um, this should be in 2T uh, this is this should be in 2T 205 paragraph uh, 1 look at what she comments on this uh, she says the Son of God went away the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And again he came to his disciples and found them sleeping. Their eyes were heavy. By this sleeping, disciples is represented a sleeping church. When the day of God's visitation is nigh, it is a time of clouds and thick darkness when to be found asleep is most perilous. And so you, you start drawing this um, uh, parallelism with the church which shall be living at the end 
when the night of trial is just um, uh, near. And so he found them sleeping and their sleeping represents a sleeping church in this end time. So no sooner had uh, Jesus spoken that than the darkness began to be dispersed by the lights from the lanterns and torches. And the stillness of the garden retreat was broken by the noise of the approaching mob under the leadership of Judas, the betrayer. The eight disciples who were left at the entrance of the garden doubtless fled at the approach of uh, the rubble. And this is uh, uh, this is th this was predicted. This was predicted in the book of uh, Zechariah. I can just look uh, in passing in the book of uh, Zechariah. Um, where we are told that uh, smite that is the Christ chapter 13 verse 7 uh, the Christ chapter 13 verse 7 we are told awake O sword again my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow said the Lord of hosts smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered, and I'll turn mine hand upon the little ones. In the book of Mark, in the book of Mark, this is what we find. Uh, but chapter 14, verse 50, 51, and 52, and they forsook, and they all forsook him and fled, and there followed him a certain young man having a linen cloth cast about his naked body and the young man laid hold on it and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked this is mark himself not uh, wanting to name his own name but he is the young disciple that fled without the cloth naked we only find that the only person that followed up jesus christ was john the beloved and so that night was a night of an anguish and uh, after they forsook him, he, Jesus asked those who came to arrest him, whom seek ye? The rabble answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus then said, I have told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let this go their way. And they all forsook him and fled. And there followed him a certain young man having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young man laid hold on him. And he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. This is um, uh, quoting from John 18, 8, when uh, they, he asked them, whom are you seeking? And Mark chapter 14, when uh, Mark fled. And so, um, uh, it is believed that the young man mentioned was uh, John Mark, who had come with Jesus and the disciples from the upper room. Mark is the only one who records this incident and he designates the person as a certain young man. This was a big event in his young hire, but in the estimation of the other writers was too unimportant to record. But he he, he, he captured it to show uh, how um, the scene itself was terrifying because... Uh, Think about somebody who had been with the people for all this period, but now they are seeking him like he was a thief, he was a robber, he had caused insurrection. Somebody who has been preaching in their synagogue, but now they come and uh, the disciples being terrified and this person, this Mark John being somebody young, he could not uh, withstand the situation thinking that uh, if it is to be perished, he was not ready to perish. Perhaps they did not witness it as they too were fleeing for their lives, though the, the, the writers of the synoptic gospel, but he being the immediate participant in the action and he being the victim of fleeing from the scene will uh, write this. And so it seems John Mark, when things got hard, he always had to flee. Take an example, the instant where he runs naked and then in Acts chapter 13, verse 13, when uh, he ba abandons the, the work uh, and then... Uh, Paul disapproves of him in the book of Mark, chapter 15, verse 38. Also, it is uh, noteworthy that Mark returned not to Antioch when the missionaries had started, but to Jerusalem where his mother lived. You can check that in Acts, chapter 12, verse 12, just to show how this young man had not prepared to endure the trials. And think about this. In the time of trial and in the time of anguish, if we have not been... Um, are led to depend fully on Christ, then brothers and sisters, we shall flee. 
And uh, at later period, Paul is not only reconciled to Mark, but commends him and desires the comfort of his society in Colossians chapter 4, verses 10 and 2 Timothy 4, 11. And so um, later he realized that uh, uh, what shall it gain a man to gain this whole world and lose his soul? And for how long shall he continue fleeing from um, the mission of being a disciple of Christ? And so as uh, Paul continues in his labor, this man is reconciled unto him and he recommends him as person who is a fellow laborer with him. And so in the Garden of Gethsemane, as the prostate rubble began to rise and rally their forces to complete their mission, Peter felt that this opportunity had come. He was anxious to atone for having gone to sleep while Jesus was praying and also to make good his boast that he would stand by Jesus and even lay down his life for his sake. And so then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest servant and cut off his right ear. And we are told that the servant's name was um, uh, Malchus in John chapter 18, verses 10. So no one can question Peter's courage as uh, we may see his courage or I don't know if it's courage or if it's cowardice or if he wanted to go all the way with Jesus Christ. This You can read it in DA. It has uh, some beautiful um, narration of that. Single-handed, he attacked the whole mob, including armed soldiers. He could not wash and pray. He could not watch and pray for even one hour, but uh, he could fight a whole multitude. All alone, he courageously faced an angry and determined mob, and then, then later, during the same night, retreated, ignored, uh, ignored me, before the pointing finger of a maid you, you, you just wonder about Peter he can be able to die before men who are armed but only a maid at the door an innkeeper really threatens him and uh, he curses but uh, this is not the first uh, time we are seeing a man flee from a woman you can think of uh, Jezebel and uh, Elijah Elijah fleeing before Jezebel. This was a serious thing. Uh, Peter himself was a physical hero and at the same time a spiritual weakling and a moral coward. To this day, the braggart who begins with boasting and overconfident and ends in failure and differ is said to have petered out. And uh, think about this, that uh, Jesus Christ tells Peter, that I have prayed for you, and when you are converted, strengthen thy brethren. Which means that uh, there were still some things in Peter which were still lingering that he hadn't overcome. And uh, he hadn't, uh, let's say, find a way to, uh, to, to, to be able to tackle them. Now, we have John, the beloved disciples. And it seems that John was the bravest of them all, not only that, but we are told that he was known by the high priest in John chapter 18, verse 15. For what reason was he known by the high priest? Uh, it's not told at all. After his flight, uh, he returned, went with Jesus into the palace and remained as close as possible to his master through the remainder of the night until his death and burial on the afternoon of the next day while Peter was warming himself outside and denying Christ. No wonder he is designated as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Jesus, before he died on the cross, committed his mother to the care of John. And so, friends who remain loyal through a crisis are very few. But because of their devotion are dearly beloved. Not that uh, the other disciples could not be commended uh, the mother of Jesus, but he commended the mother of Jesus to John. And uh, there's the story that uh, this John was a cousin of... Uh, of uh, of Jesus. Now, following the rule of the Bible, just want to show you something in the Bible. Jesus adhered to the scriptures. Look at. Um, The book of Timothy. First Timothy chapter 5 verse 11. 
why did Jesus Christ have to commit his mother to John? This is what I think uh, because Christ understood the scriptures or what shall be in the scriptures. That is the, this is the, one of the reasons he left uh, the mother to John, who is believed was a cousin. Uh, in First Timothy chapter 5, um, we find that um, the younger widows, if uh, there is uh, younger widows, they should be left to, to, to the family so that uh, the church may be relieved of, of uh, some of the burdens. Uh, the younger widows, I'll just get you a verse. First Timothy 5.16. First Timothy, I think that is the verse. If uh, any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. Now, I may be wrong, but uh, I suppose that Jesus Christ, uh, knowing this, that uh, the widows should be left to their families, unless the families cannot take care of them, then uh, the church can take care of them. Uh, for seeing this verse or being the spirit that authored the Bible, he looked forward to this verse and then charged uh, uh, John with the care of uh, his mother or the care of his mother to John. And so uh, I want to enter into what is the really issue in my presentation, the trial and crucifixion of Jesus Christ, how it was a kangaroo procession in the land of uh, uh, Israel during that time. And so I'd like to share my notes so that um, at least we may travel together because I'm reading from now from uh, Taylor Bunch and uh, the book is Behold the Man. And so a master read the system that crucified Jesus by Taylor Bunch. It is believed that at this very time, Jesus was being led through the court from Annas to Caiaphas and that he had and that he had Peter's vehement denial of ever having known him. While the degrading oaths were fresh upon Peter's lips and the shrill crowing of the cock was still ringing in his ears, the Savior turned from the frowning judges and looked full upon his poor disciple. At the same time, Peter's eyes were drawn to his master. In that gentle countenance, he read deep pity and sorrow, but there was no anger there. The sight of that pale, suffering face, those quivering lips, that look of compassion and forgiveness pierced his heart like an arrow. Unable longer to endure the sin he rushed had broken from the hole. And this is uh, Terry Bunge is taking this from uh, the Desire of Ages, page uh, 712 to 713. He continues to say, Peter hurried back to the Garden of Gethsemane where he had so significantly faded his Lord. And uh, finding a very spot where Jesus had poured his soul in bitter agony in contact with the powers of darkness, he fell on his face and wept bitterly. The same spot that Jesus was praying in is the same spot. Taylor Bunch says that Peter went and wept bitterly. He could now enter more fully into the experience of Jesus and he longed for the human sin, but he had failed to give his master. He too must pass through the struggle alone. Jesus had said to him, When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren in the book of Luke chapter 22 verses 32. Peter's Gethsemane experience resulted in his complete conversion and out of the garden there came a new Peter. All boasting had disappeared and in its place was a faith and a courage that never failed him. On the day of Pentecost, it was a sermon by Peter that brought 3,000 souls to the foot of the cross. Fearlessly, he charged the Jews with the responsibility of uh, murdering the Son of God. Every Christian today must meet a similar test. In these days when genuine Christianity is being held in contempt and God's law is despised and trampled underfoot, 
we shall need a warmth of zeal and firmness of courage that will hold us fast, steadfast. To stand in defense of the truth and righteousness with the major, when the majority forsake us, to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few, this will be our test. At the, this time, we must gather warmth from the coldness of others, courage from their cowardice and loyalty from their treason. The membership of the great Sanhedrin was divided into three groups or chambers. Originally, there were 23 in each group, which with the presiding officer and the vice president made up the 71. The first of these groups was known as the chamber of priests or the chamber of the high priest and was the first in importance. It was the sacerdotal order and contained the former high priest of which there were 12 living at that time of Christ's trial. One of these was Annas, the high priest at um, the time of Jesus was elected. The time, uh, the, the, the high priest, uh, sorry, one of these was Annas, the high priest at the time of Jesus was elected each year, subject to the approval of the Roman procurator. The office usually going to the highest bidder. Others beside former higher priests were members of this order. And uh, you can read from uh, the Great Controversy, uh, the first chapter where the priesthood was bought by bribes and they killed each other soldiers to be a high priest. The very sanctuary that the Lord had ordained and he had pointed out the house of Aaron to be where the high priest would come from. At that point, you had just to bribe yourself into that office. No wonder at the dedication of this sanctuary or the temple, there was no Shekinah glory in it because it had become a merchandise rather than a means of salvation. The second group was the chamber of the scribes, sometimes also the, called the college of the rabbis. It was the literary or legal order. It is members who are the teachers and wise men and were therefore called rabbis. It is claimed that Gamaliel belonged to this order as did also Saul of Tarsus, Barnabas, and Stephen, three of his disciples. It is said that the term rabbi was first applied to Gamaliel. His greatness is indicated by the following statement from the Talmud, which uh, I'll blow on the screen. Um, we are told his, um, his greatness is indicated by the following statement from the Talmud. With the death of Rabbi Gamaliel, the glory of the law was departed. The following precept recorded in the Talmud show the reverence demanded by the rabbis and throw light on some of Christ's cutting rebukes of his order. Now, look at the reverence that was demanded by the rabbis. One, the honor due to a teacher borders on that due to God. Now, this, this, you know, you have to pause for a minute and ask yourself, can this be found in Israel? And can this be found in the church of God? We only hear of the papal system where actually the vicar of Christ is equal to Christ himself. But now to hear that in the days of the rabbis, we are told the honor due to a teacher borders on that due to God, this borders to blasphemy. And uh, uh, I think there is something in the of ages uh, I have to put on the screen. Uh, In Desire of Ages. Uh, Desire of Ages, page 74.3. Desire of Ages, 74.3. It says, Yet Jesus shunned display. During all the years of his stay in Nazareth, he made no exhibition of his miraculous power. He sought no high position and assumed no title. His quiet and simple life and even the silence of the scriptures concerning his early years teach an important lesson. The more quiet and simple the life of the child, the more free from artificial excitement and the more in harmony with nature, the more favorable is it to physically, to physical and mental vigor and spiritual uh, strength. Uh, and so the titles that these people had was a profanation of the name of God. Number two, the saints of the scribes were weighted than those of the law. No wonder 
these people had translated the Bible to a Jemara, to a Mishnah, to Talmud, and then to oral law. At the time Jesus Christ is coming, they didn't have any scriptures, but they have the traditions of men teaching us the commandments of God. And Christ had a problem with this. This is the very things that we read in the papal system, but they were in Israel. But why were Israel in such a situation? Because they were under the rulership of the Romans. And so to find them having the law, like the laws of the Romans, is not uh, something surprising, but yet scary. And these are the very things that continue in the church even today. Number three, if anyone thinks evil of his rabbi, it is as if he thought evil of the tunnel. If anyone quarrels with his rabbi, it is as if he contended with the living God. If anyone opposes his rabbi, he is guilty in the same degree as if he opposed God himself. And you can see Chandler, volume 2, page 316. Very massive things that we are reading from this book, uh, experts from uh, the book Behold the Man. Jesus refused to give the scribe the respect they demanded, therefore they hated and persecuted him. This system of Jewish jurisprudence was nothing but papal. No wonder Christ had nothing to do with it. Now, in uh, Chandler, volume 2, page 321, we read, The third division of the great Sanhedrin was the chamber of the elders. So the first chamber was the chamber of the retired high priest. The second one was of the rabbis. And the third one was the chamber of the elders. This was the patriarchal order and represented the popular and democratic element of the nation. To this class belonged Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, the former being one of the three richest men in Jerusalem. The Talmud declares that each of whom the three could have supported the whole city for 10 years. Now, you remember Nicodemus, when persecution broke, he is the one that supported the disciples to carry out the work. He is the one that came to Jesus and even at the time of uh, the trial, he told them, will you condemn a man before you hear him out? Now, after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, he came and took his body. And then uh, the history says that he supported the disciples with his will for all that time. Now, Doras was another member of this order. He hired men to assassinate the high priest Jonathan in 52 or 53 AD. The money was furnished by the Roman governor Felix because Jonathan had criticized his administration. Josephus and the Talmud give us the names and biographies of more than 40 of the members of the Sanhedrin that condemned Jesus. Most of them were haughty, ambitious, overbearing, scheming priests who believed themselves to be infallible. The three orders that composed the Sanhedrin are often mentioned in the New Testament, and uh, you can look that in uh, Matthew chapter 26, verse 57 and 59, and then Mark 14, 43 at your own time. The qualification for membership in the Great Sanhedrin, if strictly enforced, will make injustice impossible. The following are the most prominent membership requirements as listed in Hebrew literature. Now, think about this, that um, if this Sanhedrin adhered to its own laws, it could not be easy for Jesus Christ to be crucified. But they became savages of their own laws. They could not follow their own laws. And why could they not follow their own laws? They feared that the Romans would come and take their nation away. And uh, because they expected Jesus Christ to come in a form that he did not come in, they had nothing to do with him and had to crucify him. So, again, the qualification of the membership in the Great Sanhedrin, if strictly enforced, will make injustice impossible. And so let us look at the qualification for being one of the members. Number one, to be eligible for membership in the Supreme Court of the Jewish and Jewish, a man must be a Hebrew and a lineal descendant of Hebrew parents. Paul referred to this rule when he said he was of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of Hebrews in Philippians 3.5. Number two, he must be learned in the law. He must be learned in the law, both oral and written. 
he must be well versed in both the Mishnah and the Gemara, which together make up the Talmud. Number three, he must have had judicial experience in at least three offices of gradually increasing dignity, beginning with a, a local court and including two minor Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. He must have a thorough knowledge of the known sciences of the time, including that of medicine. He must be versed in the principle of chemistry and physiology. It is recorded that Rabbi Ishmael and his disciples dissected human bodies in order to become better acquainted with the physical structure of man. Eighty students of the Academy of Hillel are said to have become proficient in every branch of science known. Number five, the qualification of one being part of the Sanhedrin. A member of the Sanhedrin must be an accomplished linguist, linguist and be able to speak the languages of the surrounding nations. He must be modest, popular, of good appearance, and free from haughtiness. Yet we have just read that these people who condemned Jesus Christ were haughty. He must be pious, strong, and courageous. Why did they have to be haughty while the Sanhedrin did not allow this? It is because at that time, to be a rabbi is something that was bought, and to be a high priest is something that was bought or bribed into. Number seven, he must be pious, strong, and courageous. Now, th this statement will make you chuckle because at one time, Jesus Christ, when he went to the temple, these people were able to flee from him. Number eight, he must have no physical blemishes because he was a type of the Messiah. Very interesting. To be a member of the Sanhedrin, you are a type of the Messiah. The Talmud lists 140 bodily defects, any one of which would disqualify a man for the office. An examination was made to see that the candidate was, candidate was free from all these blemishes. Number nine, to be a part of the Sanhedrin, the candidate for membership must have learned a trade or occupation. Rabbi Jehuda declared that he who does not teach his son a trade is much the same as if he taught him to be a thief, and this is quoted in, uh, this is uh, quoted by E.G. White, and then uh, uh, looking at uh, Acts chapter 18, that uh, these people had a trade. Another rule was that uh, he must be a married man and have children of his own. They must be married men and fathers, as being more likely than others to be human and considerate. The Desire of Ages originally text page 133. This also throws light upon the much discussed question regarding Paul's family status that this man was married. The reason why you were to be married is that uh, if you never knew how to rule well your family and be a just man, there is no way you could be responsible in a sacred office. And so this was one of the requirements that you were to be married well be well uh, able to take care of your own family. And number 11, and finally, he must be over 40 years of age. In Hebrew law, a boy reached the years of accountability at 12, became a man at 25, a priest at 30, and a counselor at 40. And then you can find this in the, the book of Numbers. Even to enter into the service of the law or the army, you were to be 25 years, and a priest was to be 30 years. You can find that in the book of Luke. When Jesus Christ was baptized to start his ministry, he was 30 years old and a counselor at 40. That is why you could hear, stand in the presence of the gray-haired, honor the gray men. So this was the court and these were the judges before whom Jesus of Nazareth was tried and condemned on the charge of blasphemy. It was before this tribunal that he who had departed from evil made himself a prey and the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. Isaiah 59, verse 14 and um, 15. You can think of this man sitting to condemn a just man with all these qualifications. And that is why in the system of today, you can find men who have qualified intellectually, but uh, they lack wisdom, they lack hum humanity, they lack anything that can be are termed as human when it comes to passing judgment. And so let us have a look into the Hebrew justice system. With this system in place, leave alone Jesus, no one will ever have been condemned unless it was doing uh, Satan's work. Unless this system was inspired by Satan, 
no one with those all qualification 11 qualification no one will be uh really judged easily or condemned easily to death unless this system was being inspired by Saturn because if if uh, there was no consensus among those who are holding the justice system then it was so hard to condemn somebody to death and so following are some views that um, actually uh, speaks out on this uh, system that uh, crucified Jesus Christ and how it was possible Speaking of the size of the Talmud at the present time, a student of Hebrew law says, modern editions of the Talmud, including the most important commentaries, consist of about 3,000 folio sheets or 12,000 folio pages of closely printed matter generally divided into 12 or 20 volumes. One page of Talmudic Hebrew intelligibly, intelligibly translated into English will cover three pages. The translation of the whole Talmud will with it is commentaries will accordingly make a library of 400 volumes, each numbering 360 octavo, octavo pages. The criminal jurisprudence of the 46th ancient Hebrews, Mendelis, Menda, Mendelsohn, page 189, not one. So comprehensive is this compilation of the rabbis that Philip Baja Beni calls it the compendium of their literature the storehouse of their tradition, the exponent of their faith, the record of their requirements, the handbook of their ceremonial, and the summary of their legal code, civil and penal, the criminal code of the Jewish. The Talmud is divided into two parts. The first division is known as the Mishnah, which means repetition. The Mishnah is subdivided into six sections. It is a vast mass of tradition or oral law, which was reduced to writing near the close of the second century of the Christian era. It is sometimes described as the text of the Talmud. The second section of the Talmud is known as the Gemara or Commentary. Interesting. It is the rabbinical exposition of the meaning of the Mishnah. So the Mishnah is a, a subdivision of the Talmud, the Gemara is also a subdivision of the Talmud, but a commentary and an exposition of the Mishnah itself. The relation between the Mishnah and the Gemara may be compared to a bill introduced into a Congress or Parliament and the debate and discussion that follows. So you give the Mishnah, you have the Talmud itself. And first of all, you have the Bible. Then you have the Talmud itself. And you have the Mishnah, but then the Mishnah have to have a commentary. So you are not having even a commentary on the text, but you are having a commentary on a subdivision of a writing of the Bible. Very interesting. The Talmud is revealed by the Jewish as much or even more than are the scriptures. The Bible is sold, the Mishnah paper, or the Gemara, Balmi spice, is a rabbinic adage. The Talmud is to the religion of the Jewish what the tradition of the fathers are to the Roman Catholic Church and its doctrines. Hebrew law provided four methods of punishments for capital crimes. These were beheading, strangling, burning, and stoning. The Pentateuch and the Talmud enumerate 36 capital offenses. Two were punished by beheading, six by strangling, ten by burning, and eighteen by stoning. Crucifixion was not a Jewish punishment. Do you hear that? The Jewish punishment were beheading, strangling, burning, and stoning. Crucifixion was not a Jewish punishment. Beheading was accomplished by tying the culprit to a post and severing the head from the body with a sword. Strangling was effected by burying the victim to his waist in mud or soil and then tightening a cord around his neck until he suffocated. Burning had no resemblance to the form of punishment used on heretics during the Middle Ages. A pit was dug in which the victim was made to stand and then soil was thrown in and tumbled down until only his head and shoulders remained for seven above, above ground. 
A cord was then roped around his neck and two strong men drew on the two ends until suffocated, suffocation resulted. When the lower jaw dropped because of unconscious, con because of unconsciousness, a lighted wick was thrown into his mouth. It is not what we see in the movie about dark ages and people being put um, uh, on the cross at stake, like what uh, we hear or we read in the Great Controversy happened to John Haas and uh, who was uh, the other one? I'm forgetting the name, but uh, Haas was burned at stake. Yeah. And so that was the burning. And then uh, talking about stoning, how was stoning accomplished? Stoning was accomplished by taking the criminal to the top of a rock or cliff, stripping him off his clothes and throwing him with violence to the bottom. If this did not produce death, the witness says to the crime through heavy stones onto the body. If life still remained, the bystanders were permitted to cast stone till the victim was dead. The hands of the witness shall be fast upon him to put him to death and afterward the hands of all the people so thou shalt put the evil away from among you this is a quotation from deuteronomy 17 7. this is the authority for the rule this method of stoning throws light on the effort to put christ to death at nazareth when he claimed to be the messiah as recorded in luke 4 28 they took him at the uh, uh, uh the brow of the cliff and they wanted to throw him headlong that he may not be alive Stoning was the penalty for blasphemy, and the record indicates an attempt to stone Jesus because of his claim to divinity. By saying he was the son of God, uh, he claimed to be the son of God in the highest sense, and the Jewish could not uh, uh, gaze on what he was saying. They got it very clearly. Hebrew jurisprudence provided no advocates either to defend or prosecute. I want you to listen to that. Hebrew jurisprudence provided no advocates either to defend or prosecute. So these people were coming to accuse Jesus Christ and who held his case. Who are they? The judges were the defenders and the witnesses, the prosecutors. You see that? Anyone could just come and say, I have seen so and so do this. He was a prosecutor. And then the judges were the defenders. They could decide the case in any way. The only prosecutors known to Talmudic criminal jurisprudence are the witnesses to the crime. Their duty is to bring the matter to the cognizance of the court and to bear witness against the criminal. In capital cases, they are the legal executioners also. Because after the case had been decided, they were the first to throw the stone. Of an official accuser or prosecutor, there is nowhere any trace in the laws of the ancient Hebrews. The criminal jurisprudence of the ancient Hebrew, Mendel Soin, page 110 by Chandler. The Jewish considered paid advocates as barriers to justice. In this opinion, the Jews were not alone. Plato considered lawyers the plague of the community. And when King Ferdinand of Spain sent colonies to the West Indies, he gave instruction that no lawyers should be carried along, lest lawsuits should become ordinary occurrences in the new world. And so, in Hebrew law, at least two witnesses were required to bring conviction. The foundation for this rule is found in Deuteronomy 17, verse 6. At the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. See also Numbers 35, 30 and Deuteronomy chapter 19. Verse 15, the testimony of the witnesses must agree in all essential details or it was rejected. If one witness contradicts another, the testimony is not accepted. This was in Mishnah. And so, but you find in the case of Jesus Christ, they came and they did not agree at all with their cases. But yet this Sanhedrin decided that Jesus Christ was not worthy to live. Continued on, Hebrew law did not permit any circumstantial evidence in a criminal case. Uh, say that uh, a case is going on and then there just arises a witness out of circumstance. And uh, this happens in, uh, 
in question and answer period in churches also, where actually somebody asks a question and from the question, that original question that is asked, out of circumstances, another one adds on that because the question has been asked. So in the Jewish system, no circumstantial evidences were allowed that just a person comes and he says, oh, also I know him, he did this and this. Such a thing was not allowed at all. But remember, Jesus Christ was convicted out of circumstantial evidence, not an original witness. You remember that. Here say evidence was bad equally in civil as in criminal cases, no matter how strongly the witness might believe in what he had and however worthy and numerous were his informants. The martyrdom of Jesus, Rabbi Isaac M. Weiss, sonarets. In a Hebrew court, witnesses are not required to take oath because whosoever will not tell the truth without an oath will not scrapple to assert falsehood with an oath. And that was what the Talmud uh, said. This is a logical and is in harmony. This is logical and is in harmony with the teachings of Jesus in Matthew 5, 33 to 37. Thou shalt not. You, let your yes be yes, let your nigh be nigh. Do not, um, do not vow by heaven because it is the Father's uh, dwelling place and not by earth because it is his footstool. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Under Hebrew law, false witnesses were very, very severely dealt with. Perjury placed a witness in a position as serious as that of one he testified against. Hebrew law provided that False witnesses should suffer the penalty provided for the commission of the crime which they sought by their testimony to fix upon the accused. So if you came and accused someone, then if he was worthy to die and you are a false witness, your end will be death. And uh, this Sanhedrin, if it adhered to its own laws, then no one standing in that place that day would have still been alive. All of them would have been, uh, uh, they would have been um, killed or uh, they could have qualified themselves for death. So Hebrew law provides that full witness should suffer the penalty provided for the commission of crime which they sought by their testimony to fix upon the accused. This is by the uh, Chandler in the trial of Jesus. And uh, in his volume one, page 140 of the book, The Trial of Jesus. This rule is based upon, what, uh, upon uh, Deuteronomy 19, 18 to 21. Such a rule is, if strictly enforced, will soon reduce perjury to a minima. The application of the principle will also close the mouths of gossipers. Every possible precaution was taken to render impossible the wrongful conviction of an accused person. The student of Hebrew law is at times astonished by the excessive caution in, cal, inculcated in criminal procedure. And um, let's see. Yeah. The, the student of Hebrew law is at times astonished by the excessive caution inculcated in criminal procedure. The judges leaned all the way to the side of the defendant and gave him the advantage of every possible doubt. That is the trial of Jesus uh, by Chandler, page 153 and 144. So, if a person was accused and brought before the Sanhedrin, the work of the Sanhedrin, they leaned mostly on the side of the accused rather than the accuser so as to give every advantage to the accused. But when it came to Jesus, we shall be seeing how every possible law was broken so as um, to convict Jesus himself. And so I continue with this expert, except, and uh, then more effectively to safeguard justice, a series of maxims were prepared to guide the judges in their work. A judge should always consider that a sword threatens him from above and destruction yawns at his feet. Be cautious and slow in judgment. Send forth many disciples and make a fence around the law. When a judge decides not according to the truth, he makes the majesty of God to depart from Israel. 
but if he judges according to the truth were it only for one hour it is as if he established the whole world for it is in judgment that the divine presence in israel has it is habitation these and many others recorded in the talmud remind judges of their solemn duty and responsibility besides these maxims there were four fundamental rules of procedure in criminal cases that safeguarded justice strictness in the accusation publicity in the discussion full freedom granted to the accused and assuring the against all dangers or errors of testimony this is history des institution de mois by salvado being quoted by chandley um uh, quoting this noted Jewish physician and lawyer calls him the Jewish Blackstone. Now, in Hebrew jurisprudence, every possible effort was made to save and protect human life because it belonged to God. The Mishnah declared that the Sanhedrin, which so often as once in seven years condemns a man to death, is a slaughterhouse. So, if the Sanhedrin would condemn a man to death in seven years it was considered a slaughterhouse but then revisit the history of the jewish at the time of jesus christ how many people were put in prison and every year they were at a certain festival crucified just to appease the romans and to appease the people so uh, as true to their book they were a slaughterhouse and so Continued on, Benny declares that it was a maxim of the Jews that the Sanhedrin was to save, not to destroy life. Other maxims recorded in the Mishnah are, man's life belongs to God and only according to the law of God may it be disposed of. Whosoever preserves one worthy life is a meritorious as if he had preserved the world. To ensure justice to the accused, the arguments must begin in his behalf. Nothing was permitted to be said against him till after at least one of the judges had spoken in his behalf. In case of conviction in a capital trial, sentence could not be pronounced till the afternoon of the second day. When was Jesus crucified? Not. When was he convicted even to death? Not even after 12 hours. After the first conviction, the judges left the hall of hewn stone and gathered in groups of five or six to discuss the case. They then walked home by twos, arm in arm, stall seeking for argument in behalf of the accused. Now, the, this can bring tears in your eyes. This Jewish system, the Sanhedrin, was the best upon the face of the earth. If a case is brought before you as the judge, as a priest, as a high priest, you could have an audience with the accused before you hear anyone. If just somebody comes and say, Sami have stolen to the high priest, to the judge or to the priest, then the judge will hush him and then have some time, even two hours with uh, the accused or say with me. And then he could converse with me and converse with me and get everything he can get from me before he continues to listen to the uh, one who is accusing uh, the person that is brought for an accusation. And then after doing that, he could relate to another judge. And then they left this person and went home. And we are told arm um, to arm, um, trying to convince themselves that the accused was innocent. Think about that if that could have happened with Jesus Christ. Could Jesus Christ have died? If that happens in the cases that are brought before the judges in our lands, how much more will it be of a redeeming rather than the condemning? And so that one almost uh, made me become emotional. I'll, I'll just read it again. Nothing was permitted to be said against him Till after at least one of the judges had spoken in his behalf. In case of conviction in capital trial, that is death, sentence could not be pronounced till the afternoon of the second day. This is the statement I'm talking about. After the first conviction, the judges left the hall of Hewnstone and gathered in groups of five or six to discuss this, the case. 
They then walked home by twos, arm in arm, stalled, seeking for arguments in behalf of the accused. What a blessed Sanhedrin it was, yet so perverted that their own loss that night could not be remembered by any of these people. After sunset, they made calls on one another to discuss the case further and to pray for divine guidance. How many times did these people pray in the case of Jesus? The next day was supposed to be a day of prayer and fasting, nothing being eaten till the case was disposed of. Brothers and sisters, you hear what the Sanhedrin was made of and how it operated. That if a case and more so a capital case was brought before them, this was the state of the church or the priesthood, I mean, rather. That uh, this could not be done until two days were spent in conversing with each other. And then a day was declared for a fast to consider or to seek divine guidance on this matter. And so, after the morning sacrifice, the judges reassembled and carefully reviewed the evidence. Judges were permitted to change their votes to favor the accused, but not to condemn him. The Sanhedrin delib deliberated all day till near sunset when the final vote was taken. If the accused was again pronounced guilty, the witnesses led him forth to the execution while the Sanhedrin remained in session. A man was stationed at the door of the hall with a red banner and another mounted on a horse followed the procession, he also having a red flag. The latter proclaimed to the gazing multitude that if anyone knew of any evidence in favor of the prisoner, he should come forth and speak. If any responded with any new evidence, the procession was halted or halted and the banner waved to announce to the guard at the door of the hall that the prisoner was being returned to the Sanhedrin for a new trial. Or if while the prisoner was being taken to the place of execution, a person came to the hall and announced that he had fresh evidence in behalf of the accused, the man at the door waved his banner and the procession was halted and the witness brought back their prisoner for a new hearing it was before a court with such a marvelous maxims and rules to ensure justice that a wrongful conviction was impossible that jesus the innocent one was unjustly tried and condemned to die that we do we who deserve nothing but death might be justified and given eternal life christ was treated as we deserve that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. With his stripes we are healed, and this is the desire of ages, page uh, 25. And so as I bring this to a close, and as we shall be going to part two, think about the things we have read. It is then evident that uh, the Jewish plot had nothing to do with it is just justice system, but to conduct what the devil had always planned to do from the beginning. In fact, we are told that um, the Jewish people themselves were incited by the Sanhedrin to condemn Jesus. But the very person, the very first person who said crucify him, they were not the Sanhedrin. They were not the people, but it was Satan himself. Out of that echo was heard, crucify him, crucify him. And then the people just echoed the sentiments of the demons that were assembled in that court. Now, sometimes we think that we are the very people who are speaking things when actually we are just echoing what Satan has started to speak to us in our minds. It is evident that if the law was followed according to the Sanhedrin itself, Jesus Christ could have not been condemned by this system. But because the system had been perverted and Satan was in control, this resulted in his death. But it is the death for you and for me that we might live and not die. 
Jesus was condemned by false witnesses in Matthew chapter 26, 59 to 62. And even their witnesses could not agree when you read Mark chapter 14, verse 59, which according to the justice system should have made the case to be dismissed, not even reviewed. And as their puppet kingdom was taken away in AD 70, so shall the misused kingdoms of this world be eventually done away with. The kingdom of sin that the devil thought it would bring freedom, but has only caused woes. And so we have a burden in our hearts. You should have a burden because I have a burden. That not one of us may be found practicing against the system they themselves even have put in place. This is not a system God had put in place. This is their own system they had put in place to ensure that no one was condemned unjustly. But the very system they put in place to make sure that no one was condemned it is the very system that condemned everyone. And so the historical existence of Jesus and legitimacy of Christianity has made authentic not by professors of it by the objectors but of it but by the objectors of it. It is quite erroneous to suppose that the true Christian is bound to offer any further proof of the genuineness or authenticity when you continue this judicial system. And uh, we may go on and on and see uh, the justice that Jesus Christ got and we shall find it now. But then after the crucifixion as we shall be seeing one man who had been deceived by this system, the centurion who pierced Jesus Christ himself. I want to end on this point. As we shall go into the next presentation, we shall see that it came to a point he said, truly this man was the son of God. After seeing everything that happened in the after this man declared Jesus was the son of God. To some of us, it will be too late to say who this man was the son of God. We have learned to do evil to the point that we will never return to do good. Can an Ethiopian change his skin and can a leopard change his spot? So these people are accustomed to do evil. Can they do good? But tonight, I want to tell us one good news. The reason why Christ has not come today, it is because he loves us and he has no pleasure that even the wicked man should die, but all should come to repentance and share in eternal life. But as I shall be coming back, I'll look at why was Christ condemned to death? And we shall continue seeing the experts uh, from Taylor Bunch, Behold the Man. In John chapter 20, verse 30, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but they are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. That is only what the Jewish people had to do, but they failed to do this because they were living under a system that had corrupted their mind. And we are told in this uh, last quote, uh, I love this quote, and the reason I love it is because daily it reminds me of uh, the shortcomings I have and just to be vigilant about everything. Uh, in 1SM, we read uh, thus, in closing, when I say, page 406, paragraph 1, this is where we end. This is part 1 of the trial of Jesus Christ from Gethsemane to Calvary. And so, in closing, we read. 1SM 406, paragraph 1. 
We want to understand the time in which we live. We do not have understand it. We do not have take it in. My heart trembles in me when I think of what a foe we have to meet and how poorly we are prepared to meet him. The trials of the children of Israel and their attitude just before the first coming of Christ have been presented before me again and again to illustrate the position of the people of God in their experience before the second coming of Christ. How the enemy sought every occasion to take control of, them, of the minds of the Jewish and today he is seeking to blind the minds of God's servant that they may not be able to discern the precious truth. May it not be said of us that our end will be the end of the people who crucified Jesus Christ. With very good laws to preserve life, the same laws, they are the ones that were savage and then Jesus Christ was condemned. Let us think about this. Is the enemy of the soul under the pretension that we want to keep religion crucifying Jesus Christ for the second time. May these thoughts be with us and uh, may the Lord bless us as we think about uh, these things. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you once again. Because this reminds us that man cannot be trusted at all, even with the righteous laws, before his own face. Still, man finds a way to go and circumvent around them. I just pray that uh, we may not be wearing a garb of sanctity and religion while we are practicing iniquity. And so have mercy upon us, Lord, that we may not repeat the history as it is indicated in the times of Christ's first coming. Lord, that we may be found a people who are pure and clean in our hearts. And so thank you. And Lord, forgive us for many times we have misrepresented you and pierced your son once again and crucified him afresh on the cross. Thank you because of your love upon us and giving a chance of repentance in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless us until the next presentation on why did the Jewish condemn Jesus Christ in this series of uh, the trial of Jesus Christ from Gethsemane to Calvary. Bye for now.